have a medical problem, you go to your doctor, you tell your doctor your symptoms, the doctor will probably examine you and do some laboratory tests and make a diagnosis. It may be something serious, like multiple sclerosis or lupus or maybe even cancer. And you're shocked. You say, doctor, how can this be? How did I get this? And the doctor will more than likely respond, we don't know. These things just happen. But diseases don't just happen. Every disease actually has a cause. Even though we doctors are taught in our medical training that virtually 80% of all diseases have no known cause. Let me give you a simple illustration. If you have a headache, you take an aspirin. But are headaches caused by a deficiency of aspirin? Of course not. Headaches are caused by too much tension and too much stress and not drinking enough water or eating the wrong food or some other cause. So why do we take an aspirin? Because we want a quick fix. We don't want to deal with the underlying cause of the problem. We just want to take a pill and get on with our life. But if we don't deal with the underlying cause, that underlying cause can end up causing a worse disease much later on. I'm Dr. Lorraine Day. I'm an MD, an orthopedic trauma surgeon. I was on the faculty of the University of California San Francisco Medical School for 15 years as an associate professor and vice chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I was also chief of orthopedic surgery at San Francisco General Hospital where I trained hundreds of young doctors. But doctors are never really taught to address the underlying cause of the disease. We're only taught to treat the symptoms by picking out a particular drug. But you see, this never really gets a person well. When we do not understand and address the underlying cause of the disease, then we never get a person really well. But we're going to talk today about all the different categories of diseases and show that there is a cause for every disease. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to take off this white coat and get rid of the medical mindset and we're going to sit down and talk common sense. We're also going to put together a plan where you can get well from your disease naturally and without drugs. Our bodies are made of skin, muscle, bone, and organs. The organs are made of tissue, organs such as the brain and the liver and the pancreas and the spleen, and those tissues are made of cells. So in essence, we're just millions of cells. But those cells die out and have to be replaced. So how do we replace them? How do we build new cells? The raw materials come from only one place, what we put in our mouths. If we put healthy, nutritious food in our mouths, we can make healthy cells. But if we put bad food in our bodies, then we have raw materials that will make inferior cells that will be sick cells and that can make us sick. Just think about it this way. If you're going to build a high-rise office tower and you use concrete and steel, it will be far better than if you use bamboo and tie the bamboo poles together with rope and then use mud. It's not going to last. It's exactly the same as with your food. But we rarely, rarely think about what it is that we're doing during the day when we're eating. And so we put anything in our mouths to fill our stomachs. Let's take a look at what the average American may eat for meals every day. First of all, with breakfast. A lot of people are in a hurry. They'll start out with a donut and a cup of coffee. Well, of course, neither one of these contains any nutrition. The donut is totally empty calories. It contains fat and refined sugar and absolutely no vitamins and minerals. The coffee is a stimulant, a false stimulant. It causes your adrenal glands to pour out a lot of hormones that hype you up, and it gives you false energy. Well, people say, I don't eat that for breakfast. I eat a good breakfast. And you see here I have eggs and bacon and sausage and hash browns and toast. Well, let's take a look at that. First of all, 
Yes, you have some potatoes here. That's a vegetable. But they're all fried in grease. All that does is stick to the arteries of your body, including your coronary arteries, the arteries of your heart, and cause arteriosclerosis. And here we have eggs. Uh, an egg is really the um, embryo to form a chicken. It's the amniotic fluid in the placenta of a baby chicken. And that's what you're eating. It's all fat and it's all protein. It is extremely high in cholesterol. It's meant to take uh, a little tiny egg into a chicken in just a matter of days. And you're eating it. It's too high in fat and protein for you. Here we have uh, bacon, which is all fat. And it comes from an animal that is a scavenger that will actually eat sewage. And then we have sausage. This is made from anything they choose to put into it. If you went to a plant and watched them make this sausage, you would be sick. And then we have toast. Of course, the toast has butter on it, which is pure fat and contains all the hormones and the pesticides and the antibiotics that they give to the cow. And then they concentrate it up and make it into butter. And this bread, white bread, has virtually all of the nutrition taken out of it. And it does nothing but turn to sugar in your stomach. So you say, well, I don't do that. I I eat uh, cereal. Well, of course, this cereal that you get at your grocery store has all the nutrition taken out of it. And of course, it's cooked, which destroys all the enzymes that may be even in the original grain. So it also frequently is covered with sugar. You can put milk on it. And uh, the milk comes from a cow, contains all the pesticides and the hormones uh, and the antibiotics that they give to the cow, plus all of the diseases that the cow may have will come through either in the meat or in the milk. And here's orange juice. Well, that's pretty good, except the orange juice is out of a box or out of a can. And then it has preservatives in it. And it has very little of the nutrition because the nutrition gets oxidized out of it when it is exposed to the air and when it is processed. Well, that's breakfast. You see, there is nothing that has any enzymes in it. The enzymes are needed for health. Enzymes are only present in raw food. As soon as you process food or you cook it, all of the enzymes are gone. You need those to help digest your food. If you have to produce all the enzymes yourself to digest that food, then your body has to cause an enormous workload on it and drain your energy for the day. In fact, it's been said that the energy required to digest three meals a day is more than it is required to do an eight-hour day of heavy labor. So we have lunchtime now. Here we have a cheeseburger. Mmm. Got a little bit of pickle on here and some tomato and some lettuce. The bun, of course, has virtually no nutrition in it. Yes? In the meat, you have a lot of fat and a lot of protein and a lot of potential disease. You can get E. coli or many other diseases from eating this meat, and certainly people have. You've got a little bit of smattering of uh, potato and lettuce, which is not enough to really give you any nutrition. And then, of course, the cheese. Cheese is just concentrated milk. And did you know that a lot of cheese is made from milk that's unpasteurized? And the tyramine in cheese actually upsets the balance in your brain because it, it uh, upsets the neurotransmitters, which is the chemicals that transmit uh, nerve impulses from one nerve to another. And then you've got French fries. Yes, we've got a potato again, but it is absolutely wallowing in grease. And of course, you've got a lot of salt on it. So you have virtually no nutrition here except high fat and high protein. Or you may go to another uh, fast food place and get some tacos. Well, the tacos, again, have the same components. You have a little bit of lettuce and a little bit of tomato. But you've got cheese there again. It has the same problems. And then you've got the meat. Hamburger, I am told by the meat inspectors, all hamburger is made from 4D meat. That's meat from animals that are either dead, dying, diseased, or disabled. Think about that. Every time you pick up a hamburger to eat it, and of course, millions of Americans do every day. 
Well, you might say, I eat a better lunch than that. I'll have a um, uh, tomato sandwich with a little ham on it and maybe some cheese. Here's a ham and cheese sandwich. Well, the same thing. You're eating the meat from an animal that is a scavenger that will eat anything, whether it's dead or alive. When you eat something that's dead, your body has to get rid of the putrefaction from the dying and dead things you're putting into it. If you have a piece of toast like this from commercial bread, it again has almost all the nutrition taken out of it. You see, when you use whole grains, it might have 25 nutrients in it. But they strip that out to make it prettier and to make it taste sweeter. So this turns actually almost to sugar in your mouth. So you've got the cheese, we've already talked about that. You've got the ham, and then you've got French fried onion rings, absolutely filled with fat. The onions are of almost no nutritional value to you when they're covered with fat. To go with the hamburger, you can have a nice milkshake. Do you realize that in this milkshake, you have ice cream, and many of the flavorings in the ice creams actually come from things, chemicals that are used in rubber cement, paint thinners, and various other noxious substances. Not only that, the milkshake is full of high protein and high fat. With your tacos, you have a soda, a caffeinated beverage. Here we have the caffeine again, which is an abnormal stimulant, and you have sugar in it. You say, oh, well, I don't use sugar. I use NutraSweet or some other chemical substitute. Well, I will show you that those are actually worse. Then for dinner, you have a steak. Notice one thing about this steak. You see the fat around the edges? That fat is solid at room temperature. When you eat that fat, it's solid in your body at your body temperature, which means it just coats the inside of your blood vessels just like it looks here and, of course, narrows them down to give, your, give you coronary artery disease, to give you high blood pressure. Wouldn't you rather eat vegetable oils such as olive oil because you notice that in a bottle the olive oil is liquid at room temperature that would remain liquid in your body too and your body can handle it much better so you have the steak which can contain e coli it can also contain all the diseases that are in the animal you know when the animal is slaughtered if it has cancer or some other disease the meat packers will just cut that out in the slaughterhouse and then put the rest of the animal through for you to eat. But the blood that goes through that cancerous tumor goes through the rest of the animal as well. So you're going to eat cancerous blood and cancerous other tissues in that animal, plus any other disease that the animal may have. Then you have French fries again, which seems to be the staple. Even if you had a baked potato, that would certainly be better. It wouldn't have all the fat in it. But that's a small amount of nutrition for your total daily needs. Here we have some green beans. This isn't too bad, except they're cooked. When you cook food and you don't eat it in its raw state, you destroy all the enzymes and you also lose a number of the vitamins. With that, you can have a glass of milk. And of course, we have the same problem with cow's milk. Cow's milk uh, is meant for baby cows. We are the only animal human beings that drink the milk of another animal and we certainly are the only animal that will drink milk uh, from even our mothers after we're weaned so animals really have more sense than we do well you say I don't eat red meat I eat chicken well chicken is even worse according to the meat inspectors do you realize that chickens pass by the meat inspector at 120 birds a minute by the time they could see a sick one or a diseased one, it would already be in the package. But when the, chicken, when the chickens go by the meat inspector so rapidly, they are gutted by an instrument. It takes out their in intestines and their insides. 
When, it, when that happens, of course, the feces from inside the intestines get all over the bird and all over the next bird. And so by the time they get to the end of the conveyor, conveyor belt, they are covered with feces. So they have to dump them in a very big tank of water to get rid of this contamination. The people who work in the packing plant call this tank fecal soup. Now the government allows the chicken producers to leave the birds in that tank long enough to soak up 10% of their body weight with that water so you will pay more for it when you go to the grocery store. But just think what it's soaking up. Fecal soup, not only its own feces, but the feces from all of these other birds. No wonder so many chickens contain salmonella and, and other very dangerous organisms. In fact, recently they did a survey where they went to grocery stores and actually took samples from on top of the chicken, from chicken that was already packaged, waiting for you to buy it. And they found something like two-thirds of those chickens actually had salmonella, salmonella in the package when you, when you were going to buy it. Well, we've got the same green beans again cooked. Green beans are our specialty today, I guess. And we've got some potatoes. Now, when you mash your potatoes, ma there's nothing wrong with mashed potatoes, but when you mash them, you lose more of the food value because more surface area is allowed to oxidize before you eat it. The most nutrition you would get from a baked potato, next from boiled potatoes, and then the least from mashed potatoes. And of course, it's got the gravy on it, which is thick with fat. Again, no raw food here. Now, we frequently throw in a little salad like this for a little raw food. When you use this iceberg lettuce, this lettuce that has virtually no food value in it, it's only water, you get no nutrition. A little spot of onion and a tiny little bit of tomato, and then of course you've got the croutons that have fat all over them. This is all the nutrition that you're really getting for the day, except fat and protein. Well, you say, I don't eat chicken, and I don't eat steak or red meat, I eat fish. Well, here we've got the fish. Of course, this has been fried with batter, and so it's full of fat. But even if you have fish that's broiled, it's been found that any time you broil any kind of flesh food, whether it's chicken or, or red meat or fish, it will produce carcinogens. Any kind of cooking will produce carcinogens, which means cancer-forming chemicals in the meat. Not only that, fish are generally caught within 200 miles offshore, and those fish are all contaminated with the sewage and the industrial waste that's poured into the water. Here we have again the mashed potatoes, and we've got more thick gravy on top of them, and then we've got a cooked vegetable. So if you're trying to have some nutrition into your body to build some new healthy cells to replace the ones that are automatically dying, Whatever you've eaten here today has given you almost no nutrition. In fact, it's put a terrible burden on your body because your body has to digest all this, make all the enzymes for it, and then get rid of the putrefaction waste that you form by using this. Of all the foods that we eat, sugar is probably one of the most harmful. In fact, uh, people worldwide eat about 31 billion uh, pounds of sugar. Actually, that's the, that's the number for Americans. Americans are the biggest eaters of sugar in the world. That breaks down to about 125 pounds a year for every man, woman, and child. That means that you will eat a pound of sugar every two and a half days. Now, what does sugar do? Sugar takes out of your body vitamin C, vitamin B complex, which you need to calm down your nerves, and C, uh, vitamin C helps you resist infection. It will also take out of your body zinc and chromium. Now, these two are very necessary for healing. They're also necessary for uh, keeping you from wanting to overeat. And they're necessary for the enzymatic reactions that take place in your body. When you eat too much sugar, particularly refined sugar, it shoots your sugar level up so high that your body has to produce huge amounts of insulin rapidly 
to assimilate that sugar. When your insulin shoots up high, it overshoots. It takes care of the sugar that you have, but then it overshoots and you become hypoglycemic because now you don't have enough sugar. So you are on a cycle of yo-yoing back and forth. Now, because you're hypoglycemic, you want more sugar. So you go out and eat some more sugar and your insulin goes up again. This wears out the pancreas. It helps cause diabetes. And uh, of course, it also gives you all of the symptoms of hypoglycemia, which are very, very similar to anxiety and hyperactivity. You will get shaky. You will get tremulous. You will want to um, uh, sometimes hide because you have phobias. All of these things are caused by hypoglycemia. For years, people have known that sugar could be very damaging, and of course it's addictive. It's actually almost addictive, as addictive as cocaine and heroin and some of these other things. So sugar is in almost everything you eat that is processed. You look at the ingredients on the can, and frequently sugar will be the number one or two or third ingredient. And generally they have to put them in the, on the can or on the box in the order of the magnitude for which they appear in the food. You say, well, I eat brown sugar. Well, brown sugar is nothing more than refined sugar with the molasses fragment put back in, which has been removed for white sugar. It's still bad for you. And honey, even though it is much more natural, if you take it in large quantities, it does has the same effect on your body as sugar does. So, sugar paralyzes the immune system. For four hours after you eat sugar, your immune system cannot resist disease. So you th see, if you eat in the morning, you eat a donut or some other sweet thing. And then at lunch, you might have a milkshake. And then for dinner, you might have dessert. The whole day, your system is completely paralyzed. Sugar is empty calories. It robs the body of vitamin C, B complex, zinc, and chromium. It also upsets the calcium phosphorus level of your body causes hypoglycemia. It also leads to degenerative diseases such as arthritis and heart disease, and it destroys the nervous system because it hypes you up and makes you jittery. And it depletes the enzymes and increases the level of fat in your bloodstream. So we have a lot of things that we already know about that can cause disease. You say, well, I don't eat sugar. I eat artificial sweeteners. I don't want that sugar in my body. Well, you can have NutraSweet or saccharin. NutraSweet is aspartame. These things are nothing more than chemicals. Do you realize that in these artificial sweeteners such as NutraSweet, there is uh, a chemical called methanol. Methanol is what was in the wood alcohol that was in the bathtub gin back during Prohibition and caused blindness. There have been a number of recorded cases of transient and some permanent blindness with the use of these artificial sweeteners, particularly aspartame, which is marketed as NutraSweet. Not only that, thousands of cases of grand mal seizures or convulsions or fits have been recorded from the use of this. Aspartame has been uh, put in over 1,600 food products that you put into your body. And um, uh, in one series of over 500 persons with adverse reactions to these aspartame pro products, almost 15% 15 suffered, 15 suffered from typical generalized grand mal seizures. When you eat processed food, you also eat a lot of MSG. That's monosodium glutamate. Well, glutamate is an amino acid. And you say, well, my body needs glutamate, but not in these strong concentrated dosages. Do you realize that Americans eat MSG in almost everything that is produced? If you eat in a restaurant or if you eat something from a box or a can, the chances are that it will have MSG in it. Well, even if it says no MSG on the label, look for something called natural flavorings or hydrolyzed vegetable protein. Both of those frequently contain MSG. MSG, in high doses and in any dose at all, is a toxin. So you say, well, I don't want to take that into my body. How do I eliminate that? 
Well, you eliminate it by eating your food in its natural state. If you go to the produce section of your grocery store, you will be able to buy things that don't have MSG and aspartame in them. That's why I'm suggesting that you eat as close to nature as possible. When you eat in restaurants, when you eat packaged food, when you eat um, TV dinners and things like that, the chances are extremely high, almost 99%, that you will have MSG and aspartame in all of those things. When you drink caffeine, caffeine is also a toxin. It causes uh, hyperactivity of the nervous system. It is an unnatural stimulant. It speeds up body reactions abnormally. It increases the heart rate. It increases, increases the secretion of stomach acid, which can uh, increase your chances of getting an ulcer. It can cause insomnia, which everybody knows about. And in fact, that effect can be uh, pertaining to, to the coffee drinking for at least 14 to 16 hours after you drink the coffee. Coffee, caffeine causes coffee nerves, anxiety, irritability, withdrawal headaches, and it will abnormally increase your blood sugar. That's one reason you get a lift from it. It uh, causes osteoporosis and increase in hip fracture. It, there is an increase in benign breast tumors. And of course, if you have an increase in benign breast tumors, there's also an increase in malignant breast tumors. And caffeine has been shown to cause an increase in cancer of the bladder. If you have a little glass of wine or other alcohol with your meal, you will also cause severe dehydration of your body. You know that if you put alcohol on your hands, your hands dry out. Well, the same thing happens if you put alcohol in your body. It dries out your body. And your body needs water in order for every cell to function. Also, alcohol kills liver cells and it kills brain cells. Now, if you have a lot to waste, you're better off than the rest of us. Here are some of the things that milk will cause. Allergies, eczema, an increase in your cholesterol. And milk is one of the main causes of osteoporosis. Oh, you say, no, I have to drink milk so I don't get osteoporosis. No. Osteoporosis is not caused by a lack of calcium. Osteoporosis is caused by two main factors. Now, smoking also enters into it. You certainly don't want to smoke and put all of those uh, bad elements into your body. But mainly, osteoporosis is caused by a lack of activity. People aren't getting out and exercising regularly. And too much protein in the diet. Protein, particularly animal protein, is very acid. It causes acid in your body. In order for the body to neutralize that acid, it has to take calcium out of your bones. So really, the more milk you drink, the more osteoporotic you become. Milk has been shown to be a major factor in the onset of uh, diabetes type 1. That's called juvenile onset diabetes. It seems that in the milk protein, the protein we call whey, that's W-H-E-Y. Remember little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey? Well, it's that whey that has a protein in it which uh, is very much like a protein that's in your cells in your pancreas called the islets of Langerhans cells that form the insulin. So when you take this protein in milk into your body, your body will produce antibody, un antibodies against that foreign protein. But since the protein in your pancreas cells is much like that other protein, your body will then start destroying those cells so then you can't produce insulin. And that seems to be one of the major causes, and this is well documented in the medical literature, one of the major causes of juvenile onset diabetes, the diabetes that is so serious that requires insulin all, all the rest of your life. Milk has shown to be a factor in an increase in breast cancer, certainly is a factor in heart disease because it contains really uh, mainly fat and protein. There is an increased incidence of leukemia in milk drinkers, and that's probably because something like 80% of the dairy herds in America are infected with the bovine leukemia virus. Did you know that? So when you drink the milk, the leukemia from the cow may be transmitted 
to the human. Now you say, well, the milk is pasteurized, and when it's heated to a high level, maybe it will kill that. Well, first of all, you have to realize that a lot of milk gets put together. Some of it's pasteurized. This is an error, but you know human error. So you can get unpasteurized milk in with the pasteurized milk. There is a, a connection of milk with multiple sclerosis with Lou Gehrig's disease, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, with the Crohn's disease of the colon, this is a colitis type disease, and of course it causes mad cow disease, which is in human beings it's called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, and it's virtually the same thing as Alzheimer's, only it occurs in very young people. Milk is associated with ulcerative colitis and uh, female infertility as well as learning difficulties. So here you've got milk, coffee, caffeine, or any caffeinated beverage, you know. You've got sodas, and they all have caffeine in them these days. People drink them to, to uh, help give them a lift. And then you have white bread, where they take all the nutrition out of the wheat bread, and then they put in a few vitamins and minerals, and then they call it enriched. Well, this, this does not build healthy cells. They do the same thing with rice. Take organic brown rice. They can take all of the outer uh, coating off of the rice, and now you have white rice instead. There's something else uh, that we discussed. The MSG and the aspartame are called excitotoxins. In fact, there is a book out called Excitotoxins written by a neurosurgeon, Dr. Russell Blaylock. You can actually get it at your, um, at your bookstore. These excitotoxins cause headaches, they cause grand mal seizures, they cause brain tumors, Alzheimer's, they contribute to Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and they actually have an effect on the endocrine system. So if you have hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, you have to actually consider whether these things are part of that problem. Also, these excitotoxins, MSG and aspartame, which is the NutraSweet brand, uh, cause dif difficulties in embryological, neurological development. So if you are pregnant, you better start thinking about eating natural. Well, if it's not bad enough that we have all of these problems with our food, we take medications. And medications, of course, all have side effects. The antihypertensive drugs such as reserpine and aldamet and catapress, uh, they will cause an indoral, will cause depression and delirium. Anticonvulsants like dilantin and tegretol and clonopin cause depression, disorientation, delirium, hallucinations, plus many other problems as well. Anti-inflammatory drugs like indocin and naproxen can cause depression, confusion, paranoia, delirium, hallucinations. And many of these uh, have liver toxic effects. Some of them are toxic to the kidneys. And the steroids, of course, like prednisone, they cause depression, anxiety, osteoporosis, and many other symptoms as well. Even antibiotics have lots of side effects. And antibiotics even don't really cure disease because, you see, when we use antibiotics, antibiotics only kill. They will kill some bacteria. They don't even do that very well anymore. They do that if we're lucky. But you see, if you take antibiotics, they will be wiping out the good bacteria in your colon. And so then you are susceptible to things like candida or chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, things like that, because you need those good bacteria in your colon to help digest and assimilate your food. So when we take medications, they all have side effects. They all are harmful in some way. So when you, when you take a drug, you may relieve the symptoms of the disease that you're attacking. But drugs never cure disease. They only change the form or location of the disease. In fact, even with antibiotics, every doctor and nurse has seen patients die who have been given doses of the appropriate antibiotic. When you get well, it is not the antibiotics or any other drug that gets you well. There's only one system in your body that can get you well and keep you well from every disease, and that is your immune system. 
When you take drugs into your body, every single drug has an adverse effect on your immune system. What we really need to do is learn how to get out of the way, eat right, and, and get rid of the medications in our lives so our body can learn to heal itself. Now, if you're on medications, I want to give you a warning right now. After you hear this presentation, you may say, I want to get off of these. You can't get off of your medications rapidly. Don't stop them uh, abruptly. When you get off your medication, you want to do it slowly and under the care of a knowledgeable health care practitioner. But indeed, you do want to get off of your drugs. And after you hear what we have to discuss today, you will see that you can be well without drugs. There are a number of other things that we do every day without even thinking about it. Things that are so routine they never even cross our mind. If we drink water out of the tap, it contains chlorine. Chlorine is a poisonous gas. The government tells us we have to have chlorine in the water for our safety. However, many cities around the world are actually uh, purifying the water with ozone treatment, which is a harmless substance. It's a form of oxygen. And yet they add chlorine to it after the oxygen has done its work. Fluoride is also in the water. The government is mass medicating the public. We're told that it's necessary for preventing tooth decay. But there's a big controversy about whether fluoride actually does prevent tooth decay. And in fact, fluoride is a poison. It is a byproduct of aluminum production, and it's used in rat poison. It also causes brittle bones. It causes premature aging of the skin. And again, it is very controversial as to whether it really prevents tooth decay. Not only that, Congress has recently made a law that they have to have a warning on toothpaste that contains fluoride because some young children have actually died because they've swallowed the toothpaste after brushing their teeth and some have died or gotten very sick in dental offices after they swallowed the fluoride that was put in their mouth uh, in the special treatment there. It also uh, has a, an impact on the brain. In fact, there's an article in the journal Brain Research, 1998, that shows that one part per, per million of fluoride can cause Alzheimer's disease. And that is the amount that is generally in our water supply. Then, of course, there are things that are good for our health that we don't do as Americans regularly. We don't exercise regularly. We don't get enough oxygen out in the fresh air. We don't go out in the sun daily. In fact, doctors are telling us always to stay out of the sun, but sun is beneficial for your health if you do it in the right way. We don't sleep enough at the right times. We don't drink enough water. And we're totally stressed out, and therefore our elimination of wastes is not good. Exercise has a number of benefits. It increases circulation, it increases oxygen to the total body, it improves your intestinal peristalsis, so helps you eliminate waste, it increases your body muscle, so your muscle can burn fat, it increases the body's ability to withstand stress, it helps eliminate toxins, it lowers your cholesterol, it decreases your weight, it uh, lowers your blood pressure, it decreases your resting heart rate, and the list goes on and on. And yet people are all couch potatoes. They sit in front of the television day after day instead of getting out in the fresh air and exercising. Water is another component. Everybody is drinking caffeinated beverages, either coffee or soda. And water is uh, the second nutrient in the body after oxygen. We can only live a few minutes without oxygen and we can only live a few days without water. Water decreases blood pressure, decreases anxiety, decreases allergies and, and asthma, and we'll discuss exactly how it does that. It decreases arthritic pain by rehydrating the cartilage in the joint. It decreases back and neck pain by rehydrating the little disc that's in between your vertebrae. It can cure ulcers. Yes, water can actually cure ulcers because if you have enough water in your body, you can produce enough mucus to protect the lining of your stomach so the acid, the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, will not uh, work through, through that mucus into the lining of your stomach. Water can decrease cholesterol 
and water decreases headaches and other pain, including migraine headaches. Sunlight is extremely important. Sunlight lowers your blood pressure. It can lower the cholesterol because it turns your cholesterol into vitamin D when the sun hits it in your skin. Sunlight enhances the immune system. It kills bacteria. It calms down the nervous system. You know, you fall asleep in the, in the sun when you lay out there. It lowers blood sugar by enhancing the body's ability to put the glucose into the, into the cell and ab absorb it. It's actually like a natural insulin. And sunlight increases the oxygen in the blood and it's used by the tissues of the body. It decreases resting heart rate and increases tolerance to stress. Oxygen is so terribly important because cancer cannot thrive in a high oxygen environment. And when you take more oxygen into your body, you displace the carbon dioxide, which is a waste product, which you want to get rid of. And of course, oxygen kills bacteria and viruses. So fresh air plus sunlight are very important together. They, they help decrease the growth rate of cancer together. They also lower blood pressure, as we mentioned. All of these things people are not doing, including sleeping. They sleep sometimes uh, for in the daytime instead of sleeping. And I were actually designed to go to sleep shortly after the sun goes down and to wake up when the sun comes up. The only time the body can heal is when you're sleeping. Because when you're up and around, you are expending energy. So when you're sleeping, the healing hormones are produced by your body, and your body can repair and regenerate itself. Both the body and the mind become sick without adequate sleep. In fact, it's been shown that if you sleep before midnight, the hours that you sleep before midnight are twice as important and as effective as the hours after midnight. So if you stay up till 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, you have lost double that time of sleep. The closer you can go to bed to uh, the sun going down, the better off you are because then your rhythm of your body, your biorhythms of the body are in sync with nature. And you want to stay on a regular schedule. You want to go to bed at the same time. You want to get up at the same time. You want to eat your meals at the same time because that sort of regular schedule will enhance your body's ability to heal. Your hormones that come down that help you digest your food, that uh, help in all of the reactions in your body, will come down at regular times if you are on a regular schedule. Otherwise, it's all helter-skelter, and your body gets so confused that you do end up with a chemical imbalance. And then the doctor will give you drugs to try to straighten out your chemical imbalance, but Drugs are just more chemicals going into your body and get you further out of balance. Stress is a great factor in causing depression of the immune system. When you are stressed, your body puts out all sorts of hormones. They're called the fight-or-flight hormones. It's the kind of a reaction you have if you're being chased by a lion or chased by a bear. You have this great rush of energy where you can run from whoever's after you. But when you're in the office or at home, you have this great outpouring of these same hormones, and yet you are just sitting. So it has a tremendously destructive effect on your body. You're not working them off by going out and doing uh, hard labor outside or exercising, and so you constantly have this chronic stress reaction in your body. This stops the in your intestines so you can't eliminate your waste. It causes your stomach to uh, secrete more acid leading to a higher chance of ulcer and it dehydrates the body. Stress is very dehydrating and of course dehydration, not drinking enough water, is stressful to the body as well. So you get into this cycle of dehydration and more stress and more stress and dehydration. One of the things that you can do which not not too many people do regularly when they become an adult, is laugh. Children laugh 400 times a day. Adults only laugh on the average 25 times a day. What happens to those other 375 laughs? 
Laughter decreases blood pressure, it boosts the immune system, it calms the nervous system, it relaxes the stomach and intestines. And in fact, it is one of the greatest builders of your immune system. The Bible even says that laughter doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart does good like a medicine. And of course, one of the most important things that's going on in your body that you don't even think about is the elimination of waste. Most disease, in fact, virtually all disease, is caused by a combination of three factors. Malnutrition, as you saw in the food that we're eating, all of America is suffering from malnutrition. Well, it's not because you're not eating enough calories. It's because you're not eating enough vitamins and minerals and enzymes. You can see that that food was really totally void of, uh, of nutrition, fat, and protein and sugar was about all that was there. When you eat that kind of a diet, cooked food, a lot of fat, and a lot of protein, your intestines get all caked with this processed material. So you have inadequate elimination. A baby, when it's born, has an excellent working elimination system. The baby will have a bowel movement within 30 minutes of each meal. That's the way we're supposed to be even when we're grown up. But we uh, deny the call of nature, we don't drink enough water, we eat all of the wrong foods, and so our intestinal tract becomes very sluggish. So we are suffering from malnutrition, and because we're eating the wrong foods and, it, and an excess of those wrong foods and not eating the right foods, and we're dehydrated. We're not drinking enough water and we're drinking caffeine. Caffeine is a diuretic. It takes more water out of your body than comes in with the drink. So the more caffeinated beverages you're drinking, the more dehydrated you are becoming. When you are dehydrated, your waste products cannot move well through your long 30-foot coiled intestine and get out of your body. And that's one of the things that causes constipation. Too much fat, too much protein, too much sugar, not enough raw food, not enough vitamins and minerals, and not enough water. And of course, the dehydrating action of caffeine. So you're not eliminating your uh, waste properly. And then on top of it, everyone is stressed. Everybody is stressed going to work, coming back from work, while they're at work, at home, and everybody's pushing too hard. When that happens, your stomach is in a knot, your intestines are contracted, and the, the peristalsis just stops, and all of these stress hormones are produced in your body. All of these things suppress the immune system, and your elimination suffers terribly. When you are constipated, and by the way, laxatives are the number one selling over-the-counter drug in America because everybody's constipated. When you are constipated, then your waste materials cannot get out of your body and you reabsorb those toxins. You say, well, why doesn't my doctor tell me this? An article in a, uh, a journal called the British Medical Journal in 1991 is entitled, Where is the Wisdom? This article shows that only 15% of all the treatments and interventions doctors apply to patients or the treatment plan they give to the patient, only 15% are backed by good scientific studies. 85% is just, well, I'll do this or I'll do that or my professor told me this or the books say this. It is not backed by hard scientific data. So you can see that when you go to your doctor, your doctor may tell you something with a very definite tone of voice. But in fact, there is a lot of controversy over when it, whether any of these treatments really work. And as the way we were taught to just diagnose a set of symptoms and give a drug to cover up those symptoms, you can see how you will really never get well by that approach. According to the American Medical Association and the government, cardiac disease is the number one cause of death. Included in cardiac disease or heart disease are angina, which is just heart pain, 
heart attack, of course, which is referred to as a myocardial infarction. Coronary artery disease, which just means that your coronary arteries, the arteries of your heart, are filled up with fat and protein stored as fat. Arteriosclerosis just means the same thing, only it applies to the arteries all over your body. And then transient ischemic attacks are like mini strokes where you can have uh, the blood cut off to one of the vessels to your brain. And so that frequently is the precursor of a real stroke. And then, of course, hypertension. That's high blood pressure. What is it that all these have in common? Well, they're all due to a narrowing of the arteries. You go to your doctor, and the doctor will give you drugs. Sometimes they'll give you a drug to try to open your arteries so you won't have the pain of angina, which just means your heart is not getting enough blood. If you have a heart attack, sometimes they'll give you drugs to try to increase the output of your heart. And if you have a coronary artery disease, frequently they will suggest a coronary artery bypass. Well, let's just think about that. Is angina caused by a deficiency of, say, nitroglycerin? Of course not. Nitroglycerin has side effects. All these drugs have side effects. Is coronary artery disease caused by a deficiency of a coronary artery bypass? Of course not. And if you have a coronary artery bypass where they take the veins out of your leg or they may take a vessel in your chest and bypass those arteries that are stopped up in your heart, what's to say you're not going to just get it again? In fact, some people have one bypass after another at an expense of about forty to sixty thousand dollars. If you have a stroke, strokes are not caused by a deficiency of medication. Strokes are caused because you're not getting enough blood to your brain because the vessels are too narrow. High blood pressure is not caused by a deficiency of high blood pressure medications. Let's talk about what all these have in common. Well, when you eat fat and sugar, which is stored as fat, and too much protein in the diet, by the way, the average American eats 125 grams of protein a day. All any adult really needs, average size adult, is about 40 grams of protein. When you eat all that excess protein, it's stored as fat. So you've got all this fat going around in your blood, and the fat in your blood makes your blood thicker. You're also not drinking enough water, so that makes your blood thicker too. And this fat collects on the walls of your arteries, making the walls um, thicker, and the opening in your vessel smaller. So your heart has to push harder to get this thicker, fatty blood through a smaller opening. What do you think that causes? It increases the pressure in your arteries, causing high blood pressure. Also, it causes a decrease in the amount of blood and therefore the amount of oxygen getting to your heart muscle, which can give you a heart attack. It also can cause slowing of the blood and a clot to your brain, which will give you a stroke. So you see, it's not very difficult to figure out what it is that's causing these problems. And in fact, uh, it is well known by all doctors that a change in diet and lifestyle will prevent or reverse heart disease. There are at major university medical schools major programs to uh, reverse these kinds of diseases. They put you on an exercise program, they put you on a better diet, they uh, decrease your sugar, they decrease the amount of uh, flesh food that you're eating, and in fact many people get better. But they say it doesn't work for any other disease? Well, we'll find out today that it does, in fact, work for many, many other diseases. I want to show you a, a letter I just recently got which says, Urgent Product Withdrawal. There is a notice on a drug called Posicor, 
which is an antihypertensive and an anti-angina drug. And they've taken it off the market because its side effects are so damaging. There are many other drugs that are on the market that people are taking right and left, which have lots and lots of side effects. Here is a, an article from the University of California, San Francisco Medical School showing that their program with just, uh, without drugs, with just exercise and a change in diet and general lifestyle will improve heart disease. Here's another newsletter from a uh, doctor in this country which shows that anger causes a rise in blood pressure and heart disease. Anger causes constriction of the arteries, so you have less blood getting to your brain and to your heart. Anger causes the production of a lot of horm hormones that damage your immune system. And in fact, the American Medical Association has said in articles as recently as 1995 and 1998 that the uh, plan of change in diet and lifestyle will actually prevent all of these diseases. I have uh, a previous video called You Can't Improve on God where I interview my 85-year-old mother. She had a severe autoimmune disease called polymyalgia rheumatica. And I put her on the same plan that I used to get well from cancer. And she was able to get off all four high blood pressure medications she had been on for as long as 35 years. She got off of them in three weeks by following this plan of a major change in diet and lifestyle, getting the fat out, getting the excess protein out, getting the sugar out of her body, drinking lots of water, eating uh, good food with a lot of raw food, getting plenty of rest, some exercise, fresh air, and sunshine. These things all seem too simple. Uh, doctors say we need drugs, but drugs don't cure disease. In fact, all drugs have side effects. If we look in uh, the physician's desk reference, which is a huge book, it's this big, and it's very fine print, and it has the, um, all, all of the side effects of the drugs are in this huge book. It's put out by the pharmaceutical companies. You will find that there's not one single drug in that entire book that does not have side effects. Some of them are so serious that they cause death. Now, why would you want to die from a drug you're taking, which is probably a far worse side effect than the disease can cause in your body? So you see that Cardiac disease is not caused by a deficiency of bypass surgery. It's caused by too much fat and cholesterol, and cholesterol is found in animal products. Cholesterol is not found in vegetable products. You don't get cholesterol in broccoli and cauliflower and celery. You only get it by eating animal products. Cardiac disease is caused by too much protein. That's in uh, meat, poultry, fish, dairy products, and eggs because this excess protein is, store, is stored as fat. It increases the level of your triglycerides, which is a measure of the fat in your blood. Smoking also causes cardiac disease. In fact, one cigarette causes a rise of 10 to 15 points in your blood pressure. It increases the work for the heart, and it increases the carbon monoxide in the body and uh, decreases the ratio of carbon monoxide to oxygen. We need a lot of oxygen in our body and we need to get rid of the carbon monoxide. Sugar is stored as fat and has the same problems. Aspartame, which is NutraSweet, causes abnormal heart rhythm, shortness of breath, chest pain, and high blood pressure. Caffeine can cause arrhythmias or irregular heart rate. Lack of exercise, of course, uh, contributes to heart disease because you don't work off the fat. You don't get the oxygen going around to your muscles, including the muscle of your heart. Fluoride causes calcification of arteries, and dehydration causes thicker blood. And then when you don't eat enough nutrition, enough good raw, fresh fruits and vegetables, you don't get enough antioxidants into your body, which help go around your body and destroy the toxins and destroy the uh, 
waste materials that are produced by the everyday reactions in your body. So again, it's not a mystery. You can get rid of your heart disease. You don't have to undergo coronary artery bypass. There is a short, shorter term solution, which is not the ultimate, but there is a treatment called chelation, which is the use of EDTA, which is a, it is a chemical, and it is not the final answer, but this is used by many doctors, MDs, and doctors of osteopathy, where they can put a solution into your, um, in, in, to you intravenously through an IV, and it will help decrease the amount of plaque in your arteries. Now again, this is not a long-term solution. It is a short-term solution, but it can give you some buying time if you are close to having a uh, coronary artery bypass. Now this procedure has been ridiculed by a lot of doctors who don't understand how it works. In fact, this EDTA we have used uh, for patients many times who have heavy metal poisoning. We've given it to them in the emergency room. But this is being given on a chronic basis. You go and you have uh, one IV treatment after another until you slowly decrease the amount of plaque in the arteries. And that will be a short-term solution. But the only way you can really have a long-term solution is to change the way you eat and change the way you live. Now, it's not just your diet. And it's not just drinking water. And it's not just eliminating all the bad things that you shouldn't eat. It is also getting hold of the stress in your life and getting it out of your life. Stress alone is one of the major causes of death in America. And if you are holding grudges or if you have anger or if you are under tremendous stress at your work or in your home or whatever you're doing, this all causes an increase in the fat content of the blood, it causes constriction of the arteries, and it helps increase your possibility of heart disease. You really can't get well from heart disease unless you change your lifestyle. You can have one bypass after another, but it's not going to do the job. Only if you change your diet and lifestyle can you actually get well. There are lots of different types of cancer. At least we in the medical profession break them down into various grades and various types. Cancer includes Hodgkin's disease and leukemia, which is nothing more than cancer of the blood, just of a different organ. Multiple myeloma uh, affects the bones and other tissues throughout the body. Malignant melanoma is a cancer that appears to, to, to start in the skin but really can be a disease that can kill you. It's different from regular skin cancer. And then, of course, we have cancer of the brain and breast and prostate, stomach, colon, liver, pancreas, many different organs. And even AIDS is a form of cancer. However, cancer is cancer. We have all these different designations, but all cancer is caused by suppression of the immune system. Cancer is really a deficiency disease. You know, years ago, back in the 1500s, when sailors went out on ships uh, during the Crusades and, and other endeavors, many of them died. In fact, they thought a terrible disease was sweeping the country, and they were giving them the drugs that they had at that time. But these sailors died in large numbers. Finally, someone decided to put limes on the ship, and the sailors ate the limes because they were really suffering from a deficiency disease, which was a vitamin C deficiency, scurvy. When the, the sailors ate the limes, they did not die. They remained healthy. And that's why English sailors got the name limeys. Well, it took about 200 years or 250 years for the rest of the medical profession to pick up on this and realize that this was nothing more than a deficiency disease. Well, by the very same token, cancer is a deficiency disease. Cancer is caused by the same three things we talked about before. It's caused by malnutrition because you're not getting enough good nutrition into your body and you're getting an excess of bad nutrition. It's caused by dehydration because the body runs on water. 
we're not getting enough water into our body, and then stress. So if you put these three things together, I think you will see as we talk today that these are the real main causes, not only of cancer, but of all disease. I became very interested in cancer myself because I developed cancer. Cancer is probably the most dreaded disease known to man, and in fact, it's probably the most dreaded word in the English language. I developed severe advanced cancer. First, I developed a lump that was small. Uh, I had it biopsied, and it was um, ductal adenocarcinoma, the invasive type, carcinoma of the breast. This was biopsied at one major medical university a hospital as well as uh, another hospital that has a very large cancer unit. So this was documented by the pathologist to be invasive ductive, ductal adenocarcinoma of the breast. The lump was very high up on my chest here. So after I had the, the lump removed, they found that they couldn't get clear margins during the procedure. In other words, the cancer had already spread into my chest wall muscle. It wasn't yet in the nodes under my arm. So I had another uh, surgical procedure where they tried to go in through a small incision and get the uh, cancer all out, but they couldn't do it. It had spread too far. I changed my diet dramatically, but I hadn't addressed the other factors in my life, including stress, and I didn't know about the importance of a lot of water drinking. But I changed my diet to fruits, grains, and vegetables, got all the sugar out, the caffeine out, and all the other bad things out of my diet. But my tumor returned. And I will show you the pictures of how bad I really was. This is a picture of the upper portion of my chest. As you can see, the base of my neck is here, and this is the scar where I had the first removal. The tumor grew back. Here it's about the size of a marble. It stayed that size for several months while I was trying to do a number of things to make it go away because I knew at that point I was not going to have chemotherapy and radiation because chemotherapy and radiation destroy your immune system, the exact system you need to get well. Suddenly, within a period of about three weeks, this tumor grew to the size of a large grapefruit. Here is a picture showing massive growth. And in fact, it was almost getting ready to burst on my chest. And here is a side view of the same tumor. This is not breast. This is tumor. It was huge. And it became very painful. And here is another shot where I am leaning back against a couch. Here is my neck. Here is my right shoulder, and here is this tumor. It is huge, as you can see. It doesn't involve just the red portion at the top, but it goes way down into the chest area. And it actually became the size of a large grapefruit. Now, this became, as I said, very painful, and I didn't know what I was going to do because I knew I wouldn't have chemotherapy and radiation. Finally, I was able to find a surgeon who would take out a portion of this tumor because it was getting ready to burst onto my chest and I didn't want to have an open wound on my chest. By this time, I had involvement of the nodes under my arm and the nodes above my clavicle. The nodes under my arm, some were as big as the size of a walnut, and I was in a lot of pain. Any pain medicine that I took would not relieve the pain. So I found a surgeon who thought that he would just do me a favor, palliative surgery, by taking out a portion of the tumor. And he did that and then sent me home to die. At that time, I still had a lot of tumor in the central area, tumor in my chest wall muscle, and the tumor in the lymph nodes. I refused to have any lymph nodes taken out because, you see, lymph nodes are part of your immune system. So I went home and I got on the total plan the plan that is shown on my video, You Can't Improve on God, which is the plan that made me well. I started uh, drinking lots of water, as well as the carrot juice and the green leafy vegetable juice and, and uh, all natural food. In fact, 75% of my food raw. And I learned to get the stress out of my life. It was very important to be able to give my problems over to the Lord. 
I tried meditation and I tried uh, visualization early on, but I had some very, very bad experiences with those. And I realized that only the Lord can take away the stress in our life. So I started spending a lot of time in Bible study and prayer, getting the stress relieved from my life. When I did this, within eight months, the cancer was completely gone. Now, I had a lot of tough times during this period of time. This was not uh, an easy task. It was like a roller coaster ride. And I had to hang on for dear life because I had some severe ups and downs. Lots of anxiety, lots of depression. I had all sorts of symptoms. I had some symptoms of multiple sclerosis. I developed a pill rolling tremor of Parkinson's disease. I had such severe allergies that I was allergic to everything except three foods. When I would eat any of those foods, I would collapse and have to be on oxygen. We had oxygen at home. And I got so bad at one point that I was not expected to live through the night. I was not able to eat or able to drink. So I can tell you that this plan works. I was so close to death that I was not expected to live, and yet here I am alive and healthy and cancer-free. As I said, it took me eight months to get rid of the complete cancer without chemotherapy, without radiation, without mastectomy. And then it took me another 10 months to get my strength back. So you see, I have been to hell and back I can show you how to get well. Cancer is not an incurable disease. Radiation and chemotherapy both destroy your immune system, the very system you need to get well. Remember, we talked about uh, headaches not being caused by a deficiency of aspirin. Well, let's carry that a step further. Cancer is not caused by a deficiency of chemotherapy. Cancer is not caused by a deficiency of radiation. And in fact, both chemotherapy and radiation destroy the immune system, the system you need to get well. Not only that, both chemotherapy and radiation actually cause cancer. Now, we're told that the cause of cancer is unknown. But if that's not true, the American Medical Association has published an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association where they have said that 65% of all cancer could be prevented by a change in diet and lifestyle. Now, I say it's 99%, but they at least admit 65%. Now, let's see. If 65% of cancer can be prevented by a change in diet and lifestyle, then what is the cause of cancer? It's the wrong diet and lifestyle. Well, they'll sort of admit that, except they say when you do get cancer, there's nothing you can do to treat it then except have chemotherapy and radiation and have your organs out. Well, let me tell you this. Cancer is not caused by an excess of organs. So why do we keep having organs out? What we really need to do is Realize that cancer can be prevented, and even when you have it, it can be cured. You don't want to destroy the only system you have and that you need to get well. Cancer cannot form in your body unless your immune system is already severely suppressed. You see, all of us get cancer cells in our body every day. It's just that when our immune system is working properly, it will destroy the cancer cells. But when the immune system is not working properly because we're eating too much sugar and eating too much fat and eating too much protein and too much chemicals and all the other things, then it cannot destroy the cancer cells. So the cancer cells are allowed to build up and they form a tumor. Then the doctor can see it or you can see it and he or she can make a diagnosis. But then you see they tell you you have to have something for treatment that actually causes cancer. You know, when you go down to get a mammogram, women, mammograms are radiation. Your doctor and dentist will both tell you, don't get too many x-rays, x-rays cause cancer. But then they say, well, you uh, need to have x-rays to see if you have cancer. And then if you have cancer, we have to give you huge doses of what we tell you to avoid because it causes cancer. That doesn't make any sense, you see? But we have been brainwashed to think that so often. Let's take a look at some of the drugs that are used to treat cancer. 
Chemotherapy just means that it's a chemical used for treatment. Chemical, chemo, therapy, treatment. Now these are some of the common chemicals used to treat cancer, the chemotherapeutic drugs. A lot of people don't realize that anti-estrogens such as Arimidex and Tamoxifen are also chemotherapy. They think that they're in a different group, but all of them have side effects. In fact, this book, which is called The Physician's Desk Reference, is in every doctor's offices. It contains lots and lots of side effects of the medicine. It's very small print, and every doctor has this, but frequently they don't tell you all the side effects of these drugs. Let me just go through a few. Cytoxin is one of the oldest ones. It was from nitrogen mustard, one of the first chemotherapy drugs. Nitrogen mustard was actually used in World War II to kill our enemies. When World War II was over, they said, what will we do with it? They said, let's give it to cancer patients. Maybe we can kill the cancer without killing the patient. But it does its job very well. It kills a lot of people. Cytoxin causes uh, many types of cancer itself. Chemotherapy causes cancer. It causes hemorrhagic myocarditis. That's bleeding around the heart. It causes hemorrhagic colitis, bleeding in the colon, and bleeding in the ureters of the urinary system. And it causes pulmonary fibrosis. It makes your lungs scar down. It also, of course, causes nausea and vomiting and hair loss. Methotrexate has a big black box warning in the PDR, physician's desk reference, uh, saying that toxic reactions can be fa fatal. Deaths have occurred during treatment for malignancy. And of course, it uh, is also used for psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis, and yet is a, it is a deadly drug. It causes cancer in animals. It causes ulceration of the mouth, the esophagus, and the stomach. It can actually cause paralysis on one side of the body, convulsions, and renal failure. Now, the anti-estrogen drugs, which doctors generally don't classify in the chemotherapy, uh, are Arimidex, which causes high blood pressure. It causes convulsion, anxiety, blood clot. It causes vaginal hemorrhage, uh, paresthesia, where you have numbness in your fingertips, chest pain, shortness of breath, and vomiting. And, of course, a very common one, tamoxifen, also the brand name is Novadex, where doctors are sometimes putting people on tamoxifen who don't even have breast cancer just because they have a family history of it. Well, tamoxifen causes uterine cancer, liver cancer, increased bone and tumor pain, depression, ovarian cysts, blood clots in the lungs, cataracts, and retinopathy, problems with the retina of your eye. And then, of course, we have radiation. It burns everything in its pathway. When the immune system is so severely damaged, it has a very difficult time getting well. Although, if people have had these treatments, sometimes they can change their diet and lifestyle dramatically and get well. But, but you actually have to try to pull yourself out of a hole once you've had these treatments. So you say, well, how about cutting out the cancer? Doesn't that just get rid of it? Let me ask you a question. If your child has chicken pox and they're very sick, would you go to the store uh, and get medicine to try to burn out those chicken pox? Or would you go to a surgeon and ask him to cut all those chicken pox marks out of your child's skin so then the child would be rid of the chicken pox? Of course not. You can cut those out, but the child still has chicken pox because the pox marks in the skin are only a local manifestation of a systemic disease. That's what cancer is. Cancer is just a local manifestation of a systemic disease. Your whole body is very sick because your immune system is not working properly. So when you just cut out the cancer, you have to realize that all the factors that allowed cancer to develop in the first place are still in your body. Unless you change all of those factors, your cancer can either return in the same place or in a different place, or you'll get some other serious disease. Well, how about removing the lymph nodes? Doctors say, well, if you've got cancer in your lymph nodes, you've got to take them out. 
If you had an infection in your foot and you developed swollen glands in your groin, would you go to the surgeon and say, take out these glands because they're involved with the infection? Of course not, because those glands, those lymph nodes in your groin, are helping keep the infection from spreading. Well, that's the same thing your lymph nodes do when they're involved with cancer. Your lymph nodes are part of your immune system. When the, the lymph nodes have cancer in them, it's because they're doing their job. They're keeping the cancer from spreading other places. So if you go to the surgeon and have those lymph nodes removed, you're taking down the, the little policemen that are at the gates trying to keep the cancer from spreading. Then you get chemotherapy or radiation, which both destroy your immune system, and then after that, the cancer has no barriers at all. It can spread everywhere. So you see, this is not the way to conquer cancer. You need to feed your body. You need to feed your body the nutrition that it needs. People say, well, I have cancer because I inherited it. My mother had cancer, maybe breast cancer, and her mother had breast cancer. Let me ask you this. If you see a very large woman walking down the street, she's got way too much weight on her, and she has a child on either side holding their hand, and they're also very large, do you think those children developed their uh, increased weight because of a genetic problem? Unlikely. You see, mother feeds herself and mother feeds her children. We can certainly inherit these patterns in our lives, but there is a very small amount of cancer that is actually inherited. The way we get it from our parents is the way we learn how to eat and how to handle stress. Our parents, by their actions, show us how to handle stress, and it may not be in the right way. So when your mother has breast cancer or your mother has any kind of cancer or there is a cancer in your history, your family history, you will learn from your mother and your grandmother how to eat. And usually, in all of us, it's not good. And in fact, you see, I gave myself cancer. I didn't mean to, but we all give ourselves disease. We do it because we're ignorant. We don't understand that everything we're putting in our mouth either makes us more well or sicker. You see, everything we do, whether we exercise or not, whether we get out in the sunlight and fresh air, these things have a major impact on our health. So when we get these diseases, we have to take responsibility for them. We have to learn how to get rid of the disease and how to prevent other diseases from happening. So these things are rarely inherited. We do it to ourselves. The first thing you need to do is take responsibility for your disease. Again, we don't do it on purpose. I didn't give myself cancer on purpose. But most of us go to the grocery store, and we put the cancer-causing things in our shopping basket, and we take it home, and we eat ourselves into cancer. We also stress ourselves into cancer. And the very things that we do routinely every day give us cancer. As I said, you cannot get cancer unless you have an immune system that is severely suppressed. So what you want to do is learn how to build your immune system naturally. Now let's just take a look at the things that cause cancer. First of all, lots of medications that you're taking can cause cancer. If you look in this big red book that I just showed you, you will see that many antihypertensives and, and even some uh, medicines given for anxiety and depression actually can cause cancer. Some high blood pressure drugs also cause cancer. Estrogen therapy, estrogen replacement therapy can cause cancer. It can cause an increase in breast cancer. It can cause uterine cancer. It can cause... Uh, all of these other different cancers in your body. Fluoride, there seems to be a link between fluoride and cancer, according to some experts, including Dr. John Yanayamas, who has written a book called Fluoride, the Aging Factor. Aspartame, NutraSweet, is associated with uh, tumors, particularly brain tumors, cancerous tumors. We do know that with meat and poultry and fish, not only do the animals have disease, which we can potentially get from them when we eat the meat, 
But any time you cook it, not only broiling, but any time you cook these meat, these meats, they produce um, carcinogens, any kind of cooking, whether it's meat, poultry, or fish. Dairy herds are infected with bovine leukemia virus and the bovine AIDS virus. Milk is infected with the bovine leukemia virus. And in fact, a 1980 study showed that there was an increase in human leukemia in areas with high levels of bovine leukemia in the dairy herds. Sugar immobilizes the immune system for four hours after you eat it. Your white cells cannot resist disease. Caffeine and alcohol are both dehydrating agents and they look like they have a relationship to breast cancer. Preservatives are in all packaged foods, in cans and boxes, and some of these actually cause cancer. And so do the food dyes, which are known to be carcinogenic. This new uh, fake fat, the Olestra, will take the fat-soluble vitamins out of your body. You need those vitamins in order to have a healthy body and prevent cancer. Processed food, white rice, white bread, all the chemicals and the lack of nutrients that's in processed foods, all of these things contribute to a sick body. Also, something else that has shown a lot of evidence of suppressing the immune system are silicone gel implants in the breast. I would strongly suggest that if you have silicone uh, gel implants in your breast, to have them removed. There are all sorts of cases of women who have had severe autoimmune diseases because uh, it looks like because that they have had these silicone gel implants in their body. And in fact, there are lawsuits going on about that at the present time. Smoking produces TARS. You know that there is a, an association between smoking and lung cancer. There's also an association between smoking and uterine cancer and cancer of the mouth, esophagus, bladder, kidney, and pancreas. Lack of sunlight. Sunlight actually decreases the size of internal cancerous tumors. Lack of fresh air and exercise. Cancer thrives in a low oxygen envir environment. And then, of course, uh, all of these cancer chemotherapeutic agents uh, cause cancer too. And then, if those don't work, they want to do a bone marrow transplant on you. In order to do a bone marrow transplant, they have to destroy all of your immune system. Well, what can that possibly do? It's your immune system that you need to get you well. Not only that, if you have a transplant of an organ, such as a kidney or a liver, they give you the same chemotherapeutic agents to wipe out your immune system so you will not reject the transplant. As you can see, what you really need to do to get well and to prevent cancer is to feed your body well Hydrate your body well by drinking a lot of water because it has been shown clearly that uh, dehydration is one of the major factors in uh, causing cancer. And in fact, I could not get well until I started drinking large amounts of water. I'm talking about the average person needs a minimum of 10 glasses a day just to replace their water losses for every day. I had not been a water drinker all of my life. In fact, I was drinking coffee and caffeinated soda. So I found out I was about 18 years behind in my water drinking. These are the simple things you can do. Sunlight, fresh air, exercise, water, good food. These will not only prevent cancer, but this is the, exactly the way that I got well from cancer. Now, I have two videos out. I will tell you at the end of this video how you can get well from cancer and many other diseases. But this video called You Can't Improve on God is the exact step-by-step -step plan that I use to get well from cancer. And this video, Cancer Doesn't Scare Me Anymore, shows you what you shouldn't do if you have cancer. It shows the destructive effects of chemotherapy and radiation and documents it from the medical literature. It tells you why cancer is big business and why doctors are not really being taught how to get patients well. The next category is autoimmune diseases. At least that's the way we categorize them in medicine. Rheumatoid arthritis, lupus or systemic lupus erythematosus, scleroderma, 
polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and then polymyalgia rheumatica. All of these are really related to joint and tissue problems. And so the doctor may tell you that your immune system is too strong. But it's impossible for the immune system to be too strong. That's like being too healthy. When you're too healthy, you're just as healthy as you can be. When your immune system is working properly, it's not going to make you sick. If you have one of these diseases, it means that your immune system is not working properly and it's suppressed because of some of these things we've been talking about. Now let's take another look at what these doctors treat these diseases with, these drugs that are so harmful. The drug of choice for these diseases is actually cortisone or prednisone. Most doctors treat every one of these diseases with prednisone. What are the side effects of this disease? Well, right out of the physician's desk reference, it will tell you. Cortisone causes peptic ulcers, osteoporosis, softening of the bones with spontaneous fractures, mental disturbances, psychoses, degeneration of the nerves, Acne, hirsutism, which is excessive growth on the face, face of hair, particularly in women. Diabetes, hypertension, disturbances in the metabolism and utilization of proteins and fats. Reactivation of tuberculosis. Uh, it causes retention of salt and water in the tissues. It also can cause you to um, work when you don't have energy and a tremendous appetite so you will gain weight. When my mother was on cortisone years ago for a problem she had, her face got about as big as the moon. Also, uh, cortisone suppresses the immune system and can lead to cancer. This is not the way to treat these diseases. For rheumatoid arthritis, doctors will often put a patient on high doses of aspirin. But aspirin can cause gastric ulcers, ulcers of the stomach, uh, ringing in the ears, and anti-inflammatory drugs that you can get either from the drugstore or by prescription from your doctor cause gastrointestinal bleeding, peptic ulcers with perforation, liver damage, kidney failure, and high blood pressure. Methotrexate is now considered the treatment of choice by some doctors for rheumatoid arthritis. Well, Methotrexate, we just saw in the cancer portion, is a chemotherapy agent that can cause death. It can also cause cancer. It causes ulcerations in the entire gastrointestinal tract. Now, you see, these diseases are actually from nutritional deficiencies. Not getting enough of the food you need, eating too much of the food you don't need, having improper elimination, not drinking enough water, in fact, I know many patients who have gotten well from rheumatoid arthritis. In fact, many of them who have been in wheelchairs who have been able to get up from their wheelchairs and get well. Now, if you have severe permanent destruction of joints, I'm not telling you that you're going to be out dancing. Uh, but I can tell you that you can stop the progression of the disease and reverse the changes that are not permanent. My mother, as I told you before, at the age of 85, had this severe autoimmune disease called polymyalgia rheumatica, and she got well within six months with no drugs whatsoever, just on the plan that we will discuss later on how you can get well from virtually every disease. I interview her on this tape, You Can't Improve on God. And you will see that at the beginning, she wasn't too happy about changing her diet and lifestyle. But not only did she get well from polymyalgia rheumatica, when she was terribly sick, she was unable to even dress herself and she had severe pain. But her triglycerides, which is a measure of the fat in your blood, dropped 400 points in four months. Her cholesterol dropped from 280 to 120. So we go back to the very same thing and see that these autoimmune diseases are really caused from malnutrition, dehydration, and stress. We will also see that sugar 
suppresses the immune system and can cause joint pain. Water, uh, the lack of water, dehydration from caffeine and alcohol can also cause joint pain. Fluoride decreases the um, immune system's ability to keep you free from disease. Silicone implants seem to be associated with autoimmune disease and immune suppression. Arthritis has been shown in medical literature to be caused from a diet low in nutrients. Alcohol, aspirin, and saturated fats, which are found in meat and dairy products, produce prostaglandin E2, which suppresses the immune system. Carbonated drinks are high in phosphates, which change the mineral balance of the body. And a lack of exercise also can cause you to have stiffness in your joints and not get enough oxygen to your entire body. It's not a mystery why people get sick. It's the same thing with autoimmune disease as it is with cancer and heart disease. We give these diseases to ourselves. Drugs never cure disease. They only change the former location of the disease by causing side effects. These are diseases of the neurological system. Parkinson's, of course, you can develop what we call a pill rolling tremor and have a shuffling gait and actually sort of turn to stone and eventually it affects the brain. Hunting's disease, Huntington's disease is very similar to that. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also called Lou Gehrig's disease, where you have involvement of your nervous system starting at the lower portion of your body and eventually it gets up to your lungs and your throat and you can choke to death. And it's considered to be 100% fatal. Multiple sclerosis is a disease of the muscles. But just think about this. All of these diseases have these strange names. Multiple just means many, and sclerosis means hard parts. It's just got many hard parts in the muscle. It doesn't really tell you what causes the disease. Alzheimer's is, of course, dementia, but it's just named after the person that first described this kind of dementia. And again, these uh, titles only are Latin terms for describing the symptoms. They don't tell you what causes the disease. And then seizures are also a part of these neurological abnormalities. Well, how do they treat these? Prednisone is one of the main things they use to treat. And we've just, we've just gone through the side effects of prednisone or cortisone. They're very destructive. With Huntington's, they use phenothiazines, uh, which all have side effects. With Parkinson's, they use uh, certain drugs that have side effects of restlessness, confusion, depression, edema, nausea, constipation, anorexia. Uh, these are things that are very destructive to a Parkinson's patient, you see. They already have a serious problem, and now they have confusion and possibly hallucinations from their drugs. Some of the drugs, the anticholinergic drugs they put them on, cause nausea, constipation, palpitations. And you see, all of these diseases are made worse by a person not being able to eliminate their waste. So anytime they're taking drugs that cause uh, constipation, you're going to be worse off. Levodopa, which is used in Parkinson's patients, causes nausea, vomiting, hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias, confusion, uh, tremor and tics and restlessness. And of course, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. There's a drug that's used uh, to treat that where one of the adverse reactions is attempted suicide. It can also cause massive infection, ulcers in the gastrointestinal tract, bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract, hallucinations, delusions, stupor, delirium, psychosis, lung cancer, heart attack, congestive heart failure. The list goes on and on. And then when we get down to seizures, Dilantin is one of the main drugs of choice for seizures. Now again, I'm telling you, when you're on these drugs, don't stop them abruptly. Because if you stop something like Dilantin uh, rapidly and abruptly, you can go into a constant seizure, which is called status epilepticus. But the side effects of Dilantin are lymphoma, which is cancer, Hodgkin's disease, which is cancer, slurred speech, ataxia, which is an unstable gait, 
mental confusion, decreased coordination, dizziness, insomnia, motor twitchings, headache, uh, in other kinds of things called dyskinesias where suddenly your arms and hands do strange things and you can't control them, liver damage, nausea and vomiting, constipation, hepatitis, and blood formation suppression. In other words, your bone marrow is suppressed. You can see that these drugs do not cure these diseases. In fact, they make them worse. You have a short-term gain because some of your symptoms are decreased for a long-term disaster. What causes these diseases? Well, Parkinson's uh, is contributed strongly by these excitotoxins. Remember I talked about them. They are the MSG and the um, NutraSweet or aspartame. Also, dehydration makes Parkinson's much worse. And there is some suggestion that the use of caffeine can actually uh, contribute to Parkinson's because it upsets the nervous system. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis has been shown by medical studies to have an association with, yes, milk, cow's milk. Also, the excitotoxins make this much worse, dehydration, and possibly also caffeine and sugar because they unbalance the nervous system so much. Multiple sclerosis has had tremendous improvement with drinking huge amounts of water and eliminating dairy products. Alzheimer's disease seems to be contributed largely uh, by excitotoxins, again, MSG and aspartame, NutraSweet. Uh, dehydration is associated with Alzheimer's and with brain atrophy. You see, the brain is 85% water, and it weighs about 3.5 pounds in an adult. If you squeeze all the water out of it, it only weighs 10 ounces. There's an article in the medical literature where they talk about, they can't figure out why this person has brain atrophy, and when they are on high blood pressure drugs, actually the brain atrophy does not get better. They've associated brain atrophy with people who have high blood pressure. Well, it's because they put people with high blood pressure on diuretics. Diuretics takes water out of your body. You need to have water in your body in order to decrease your hypertension because when you have hypertension, it's because your body knows it doesn't have enough water and it produces a chemical that will actually constrict your arteries to make sure that you have enough blood to go around and fill all of your vascular channels. Because when you don't have enough water, you don't make enough serum to have enough blood volume. So when you get high blood pressure, you've got thicker blood that's being pushed through narrower channels because your body has produced certain chemicals like histamine, uh, vasopressin, and uh, renin-angiotensin. These constrict the arteries. So your blood has to pump thicker blood through narrower arteries. If you have high blood pressure, what you want to do is drink more water. If you have Alzheimer's disease, what you want to do is drink more water, and that's, of course, a great way to prevent it. Also, the aluminum in antacids that people take for ulcers seems to be associated with the onset of Alzheimer's, and so does a high-fat diet, because the fat clogs up the arteries, and then the, the brain can't get enough oxygen. Seizures seem to be intensified by sugar in the diet, by the excitotoxins, MSG and aspartame, by food additives, by a lack of nutrition, and by a lack of water, dehydration, and possibly caffeine. These are problems that uh, many women have. Fibrocystic breast disease is accentuated by having caffeine in the diet. Now, that's not only from coffee and caffeinated soda. But there is a caffeine-like compound in tea and in chocolate. So all of these things must be eliminated. Also, fibrocystic breast disease is increased by a high-fat diet. Any tumors, whether benign or malignant, are abnormal. By getting your body back in balance, by eating right, by living right, your body can get rid of those tumors. You don't have to always have them cut out. Menopausal hot flashes. I had terrible hot flashes. Uh, I tried to get off my estrogen replacement therapy many times, but I would have such hot flashes I couldn't stand them. But when I found out I had breast cancer, I knew I had to stop those estrogens immediately. 
and I was dreading what would happen to me when I stopped the estrogens. But as soon as I changed my diet to a totally vegan diet, no meat, no dairy products, no eggs, no poultry, no fish, I never had another hot flash. And of course, you want to drink a lot of water as well. There are some herbs that are helpful uh, in decreasing menopausal hot flashes, such as dong quai, blue cohosh, black cohosh, wild yam root, root, fennel, and licorice root. However, I think that what we should do is try to get our body back in balance and not even use herbs as drugs. If you decrease the fat and the protein in your diet and you eat a natural diet, almost always the hot flashes will go away. But you say, well, I don't want to get osteoporosis and my doctor tells me I've got to be on estrogens. Well, osteoporosis is not caused by a deficiency of estrogen. In fact, as we discussed before, osteoporosis is caused mainly by lack of activity and too much protein in the diet, particularly too much animal protein. So if you will get your diet down to eating less than 40 grams of protein a day, then you won't get osteoporosis. Of course, you want to also eliminate the medications like cortisone that uh, cause osteoporosis, and of course, smoking causes osteoporosis, and caffeine contributes to it. So you want to um, rectify those factors, but you need to get exercise, and you need to uh, get the proper amount of protein in the diet. You don't want to keep taking calcium because osteoporosis is not a calcium deficiency per se. What happens? as I said, is that when you eat too much protein or you drink too much milk, the body becomes very acid and it has to take the calcium out of your bones to neutralize the acid. Now, a lot of women say, well, my doctor has put me on Fosamax. Well, if you go to the physician's desk reference, again, the PDR, the big red book, you will find that Fosamax causes ulcers of the esophagus, abdominal pain and gastritis, that's inflammation of the stomach, bone, muscle, and joint pain, headache, dizziness, and acid regurgitation of your food. Fosamax will not cure your osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is not due to a deficiency of Fosamax. What it is due to a deficiency of the proper nutrients and you want to get rid of the excess bad uh, food in your diet. Now infertility can be rectified by the total plan that we're going to talk about. Uh, male and female mice exposed to MSG early in life actually suffered from infertility in laboratory experiments. There is some evidence that fluoride, particularly fluoride in the water and in toothpaste, contributes to the infertility problem and also a lack of antioxidants. Well, the antioxidants should be in the food that you eat, not necessarily in supplements because those aren't natural. The nausea of pregnancy is in large part caused by dehydration. When a woman gets pregnant, her body has to take huge amounts of water from her cells to form all the amniotic fluid for the baby. When you get dehydrated, you can get nauseated. So you want to make sure that if you're contemplating becoming pregnant, make sure that you are drinking lots of water, your body is well hydrated, and that you are eating proper nutrition. And then premenstrual syndrome. Actually, uh, this is also truly cured by getting your body back in balance, by getting the stress out of your life, drinking lots of water, exercising, and eating a, an all-natural diet. Estrogen replacement therapy, as we talked about for um, menopausal hot flashes or to try to prevent osteoporosis, these cause cancer of the uterus, breast cancer, abnormal blood clotting, nausea and vomiting, enlargement of uterine fibroids, and sometimes spotty darkening of the skin, particularly skin of the face. These things are easily solvable, solvable by getting yourself back on schedule, getting the body back in balance. They are never solved by drugs. It seems like everybody is suffering from some kind of joint pain or back pain or neck pain. Osteoarthritis is somewhat different from rheumatoid arthritis, at least we doctors categorize it different, differently, but all of these really play into the same factors that cause them. 
Osteoarthritis and back pain and neck pain are basically due to inactivity, the wrong diet, and not enough water. You see, water is necessary to make synovial fluid. That's a special kind of fluid that the body makes to nourish the joint surfaces. When the joint surfaces get too dry, they wear out and they can cause back pain and neck pain. But you can rehydrate those joint surfaces if they're not too bad. Sciatica is pain down the back of the buttock and down the leg and is caused generally from a herniated disc or a slip disc. That's because the discs are dehydrated, because people are not drinking enough water and the discs aren't being nourished enough by proper exercise. I had severe disc problems before I understood my need for water. I actually had them operated on a number of years ago and then the pain came back. And when I moved to a hotter climate and I wasn't drinking enough water, my pain got severe. But as soon as I started drinking large amounts of water, over a number of months I was able to rehydrate the discs. And actually the discs plump up and they stop pressing against the nerve roots. You know, as women particularly get older, they get shorter. Well, how do they do that? It's because their discs collapse in between their vertebrae. But you can rehydrate those discs and increase their size and increase your ability not only to move about and have freedom from pain, but you can move that disc out of the way by its rehydration and plumping up so it's not pressing against the nerve root. Sugar also causes joint pain. It suppresses the immune system. It is very dehydrating, and you need the water for uh, your nourishment of your joint surfaces. Caffeine is dehydrating. Alcohol is dehydrating. And, of course, a lack of exercise. Your, your joints get stiff if you don't move them. Lack of nutrients also can cause these diseases. You have to eat right. And sunlight gives you vitamin D to give you strong bones. Cortisone and the anti-inflammatory drugs will always make these things eventually worse because even though they cover up the symptoms to begin with, they cause worse problems down the line. So what you want to do is the same old song. Eat right, exercise, and get rid of the stress in your life. And we'll show how you how to do that total plan in just a minute. There is an increasing body of evidence to confirm that the onset of diabetes type 1, that's juvenile onset diabetes, is associated with the use of cow's milk uh, and other dairy products in very young children. Even if you use insulin throughout life, that will not stop the progression of the disease. The disease is a disease of blood vessels. These people can become blind. They can have terrible ulcers of their feet and actually lose their feet or lose their legs. What we need to do is eliminate all sugar because, you see, sugar also intensifies the diabetes. We should remove all excitotoxins, the MSG and aspartame, and all chemicals from the processed food. Smoking makes diabetes of any type much worse. We must institute a diet rich in vitamins, minerals, and enzymes. And I have seen people with diabetes type 1 who have been able to reduce their insulin dosage tremendously. Once the uh, cells in the pancreas have been destroyed, I have not seen them revive and regenerate, but you can reduce your insulin dosage tremendously and be a lot healthier. But the most important thing is to try to prevent the onset of juvenile diabetes, which is by eating healthy and eliminating cow's milk from all diets. Now, diabetes type 2 is easily uh, removed by eating a healthy diet. Even your doctor will tell you that that if you eat fruits, grains, and vegetables, and you eat a low-fat diet and eliminate the sugar, that you can, and, and exercise, of course, that you can eliminate diabetes type 2. That's very important because the drugs they put you on to treat diabetes type 2, or adult-onset diabetes, one of them is 
glucotrol, also called glipizide, which comes with a special warning on it. It says in, there is an increase of cardiovascular mortality, which means heart attack. It can kill you, plus it causes nausea, diarrhea, jaundice, anemia, low white blood cell count, and low platelets, which uh, are associated with clotting, dizziness, headache, and drowsiness. Another drug that's commonly used is called glucophage, which, ha which has almost the same side effects, including this increased risk of cardiovascular mortality, which is death. So what you want to do is get on your proper diet, the same song. Now, hypoglycemia is really caused mainly by eating too much refined sugar. When you bring that sugar into your body, it's a big jolt, like you've taken a hit of cocaine or something, and your insulin shoots up. Well, then your insulin eats up all that, um, that sugar, and then you become hypoglycemic, and you become shaky and nervous and irritable and all of that. And when people tell me they have hypoglycemia, I know almost always what's happened. They're eating too much refined sugar in their diet. So if we exercise, if we eat right, if we eat fruits, grains, and vegetables and get the fat, the high protein, and the sugar out of our diet, plus drink lots of water, we can certainly get rid of diabetes type 2, and it looks like we can prevent diabetes type 1 and hypoglycemia. Well, as we've learned, headaches are not caused by a deficiency of aspirin. Migraine headaches are not caused by a deficiency of drugs. Headaches are caused by the excitotoxins, MSG and aspartame, milk producing allergies, poor elimination due to dehydration from caffeine and alcohol and not eating enough raw food, dehydration from not drinking enough water. Stress, of course, leads into this as well, and stress is very dehydrating. Sugar withdrawal can actually cause not only headaches but migraine headaches. Caffeine withdrawal can cause headaches. So you see, if you eat your balanced diet, if you eat fruits, grains, and vegetables, you can eliminate these problems. Chronic fatigue syndrome. I think everybody seems to be suffering from that. This is caused by sleep disturbances, and sleep disturbances are caused by stress, not drinking enough water, and eating the wrong foods over a long period of time. Sugar causes the ability for candida to grow in your intestine, and this contributes to chronic fatigue syndrome. This is a fungus that can grow in your intestine, and it can get into your bloodstream. This uh, candida is increased by the use of birth control pills or any estrogens, and also the use of steroids, cortisone, and antibiotics, because antibiotics will wipe out the good bacteria in your colon, so the candida can overgrow, possibly get into your bloodstream, and contribute to chronic fatigue syndrome. Also, it's uh, contributed to by poor elimination, by dehydration, by lack of exercise, and by a lack of nutrients, not getting enough vitamins and minerals into your body, and in fact, uh, eating too much fat and protein. And also, uh, sleep disturbances, as I said before, have been shown to cause chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, how about fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia is increased by too much sugar in the diet, poor elimination, lack of exercise, the excitotoxins, uh, MSG and aspartame, too much fat and protein in the diet. And again, it has been shown that you can take a healthy person and by purposely disturbing their sleep over a period of three nights, you can have uh, induced symptoms of fibromyalgia, which is pain and uh, discomfort in the muscles and sometimes in the joints as well, and a feeling of fatigue and weakness. Now, candidiasis, as I uh, told you, plays into all of these others and is produced by overgrowth of this particular bacteria or fungus in the, in the intestine and by the use of antibiotics, by the use of too much sugar. Flu and colds, we can include in this group too because all it is the result of is suppression of the immune system. If your immune system is working properly, you're not going to get flu and the colds. They did a study once where they took a number of volunteers and they took pure 
cold virus and put it right up into their nose and they put their feet in cold water and blew cold drafts on them. And only uh, something like 15% of the people got a cold because it had to do with how well their immune system was operating at the time they were exposed. You know that sometimes you can be around a person who has a cold and you will get it and sometimes you won't. All we have to do is keep our immune systems working properly by feeding them right, by doing all the right natural things that we've talked about, and we can eliminate all of these problems. Now, they don't happen uh, immediately. It doesn't happen that you get well within a few days. This takes months. You see, we get sick one day at a time. It takes us years to get into this situation. It may take a year or 18 months of really hard duty in obeying all of the right rules, the 10 laws of health, for us to get out of this problem. When the body is dehydrated, a water regulating mechanism is triggered. The body produces histamine, which is the number one water regulator. It makes sure that the brain and the vital organs get enough water. But what you see, when histamine is produced in your body, then you want to have antihistamines. And you go to the drugstore, you go to your doctor, and you get antihistamines. But what you really need is water because the body produces histamine because it doesn't have enough water in it. You need lots of water. There are also some common causes of allergies, which include dairy products, milk, cheese, butter, egg, cottage cheese, yogurt, and sugar. All of these things cause allergies. Also, there is an association with asthma, allergies and bronchitis, not only with dehydration, a lack of water, but with fluoride, with MSG, aspartame, medications. Many medications cause constriction, constriction of the bronchi. They can cause other allergies and they can cause asthma. Fats and fried foods decrease immune function and animal products cause an increase in mucus formation which can make these problems worse. Now, they frequently treat these diseases, such as asthma, with something called Cerevent, which causes heart palpitations, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, joint and back pain, muscle aches, nervousness, and fatigue. And another one called asthma court causes facial edema, abdominal pain, vomiting, joint pains and muscle pains, toothache, chest congestion, voice alteration, and urinary and vaginal infection. Sugar is irritating to the mucous membranes and leaches the body's calcium reserves, generally lowering your resistance. Smoking, of course, is bad for all of these things. And the drugs that the doctor may give you have cortisone in them, and this suppresses your immune system even more. So you see, what you really need to do if you have these three problems, any one of the three, is you have to increase your water so you can turn off the histamine system in your body. Your body knows it needs water, so it produces histamine. Don't use antihistamines. Drink water and get the dairy products out of your body. All of these gastrointestinal diseases have basically the same cause, with maybe the exception of gallstones. Gallstones are really caused from too much fat in the diet primarily. But constipation and hemorrhoids and diverticulosis and Crohn's disease of the colon, these are due to not enough water, not uh, too much fat in the diet, too much high protein which goes through and is stored as fat. These kind of things all cause problems with your intestinal elimination. When you are constipated, this can cause hemorrhoids. If you have ulcerative colitis, these are frequently uh, exacerbated, these diseases, by stress. Diverticulosis is when food gets caught in little pockets in your intestine and these pockets are caused because your intestinal contents are not moving out of your body fast enough. Irritable, irritable bowel syndrome is uh, caused by an increase in stress, not eating the right food, not drinking enough water. So what you want to do with each of these, instead of taking steroids, cortisone for this disease and this disease and sometimes for this disease, you want to change the way you're eating, change the way you're living, get exercise, drink water, Eat a uh, proper diet 
without too much fat and without all the sugar that you've been eating. And of course, gastric and duodenal ulcers can actually be cured by drinking water. Now, your doctor may say you need a bland diet, but it is the water that is necessary to produce the mucus to line your stomach so the acid in your stomach does not eat through into the lining. When you do that, in fact, you can cure ulcers. 2,000 cases of ulcer have actually been cured by nothing more than water. This has been reported in 1983 in, uh, in the Journal of Clinical Gastroenterology. So these things are, even though they can be serious problems, if you get on the right diet, if you drink a lot of water, and if you get the stress out of your life, these can miraculously go away. Well, you probably have a good idea of what you need to do to get well. We're going to formulate that plan now, and I'm going to give you a lot of resource material. The books and tapes that I'm going to show you will all have ordering information on the end of the video. You don't order them from me. You order them from the same place I got them, and these were very helpful in my recovery from cancer, and they've been very helpful in the recovery of other people from many different kinds of diseases. First of all, nutrition. What do we eat? We eat fruits, grains, and vegetables in their most natural form. We want to eliminate the dairy products, the meat, the poultry, the eggs, the fish, all of these animal products because they all contain disease, they all contain uh, hormones and uh, antibiotics and pesticides and things like that which make you sick. Not only that, they contain carcinogens when you cook the meat. One excellent book is called Move Over Milk and it shows you how there is a relationship between uh, diabetes and osteoporosis and and these neurologic diseases that we talked about it is excellent it gives you all the documentation in the medical literature for why milk is very harmful uh, for you then there is the book mad cows and milk gate this is written by a medical doctor and it shows you that mad cow disease actually is in this country the country of america and how it got here and how you can protect yourself there's another book on NutraSweet, aspartame, written also by a medical doctor, Dr. H.J. Roberts, showing all of the problems with aspartame. The FDA approved this knowing that it contained uh, this uh, product called methanol, which can cause blindness and can cause convulsions. And then there's a book, Excitotoxins. The book was written by Dr. Russell Blaylock, who is a neurosurgeon. This book will tell you how MSG and aspartame, including hydrolyzed vegetable protein and natural flavorings, which frequently contain MSG, can make you sick. They can cause brain tumors. They can cause seizures. They contribute to Parkinson's disease and Lou Gehrig's disease. So what do you eat? How do you change over from this meat-based diet, this animal flesh-based diet, to a vegan diet or to fruits, grains, and vegetables. Well, I am including in ordering information at the end of this tape how you can get some cookbooks and some raw food preparation books which will help you. This one is called Edie May's Natural Recipes, which tells you how to prepare raw food that has all the enzymes in it. You see, when you cook food, you destroy all the enzymes. Anything that's heated to above 107 or 110 degrees will destroy all the enzymes. It's been found that if they feed cats food that is cooked within about four generations, they can no longer produce and the uh, breed will die out. Here's another book called Absolutely Vegetarian where you can have excellent recipes that are made from fruits, grains, and vegetables with no dairy and no eggs and certainly no meat, poultry, or fish. Another excellent book is Recipes for Life, written by Rhonda Malkmus. And uh, this is Recipes from God's Garden. Again, no milk, no eggs, 
Uh, no flesh foods, only fruits, grains, and vegetables. There are also many raw food recipes in this uh, recipe book as well. So this is a way for you to start. You can start changing over gradually if you're just looking for a better lifestyle. But if you have a serious disease, as I had with my cancer, you better change over all at once. And you might say, well, I don't like to eat that way. Well, what does that have to do with it if you want to be well? Now, the next thing is you have to start exercising. Exercise is the second law of health. If you have back problems, you want to really start exercising as much as you can uh, right off the bat. Now, if you have too much pain, then you better start drinking a whole lot of water. But exercise will help you eliminate your back and joint pain. This is a book by an MD, Dr. Batman Gellage. And uh, this is a video that goes along with it that will show you how you can rehydrate and expand the discs in your back. And, of course, you need exercise for just your general body health. The next thing is water. If you don't drink enough water, your body can't function. If your children go out and play in the mud, and they come in and they have filthy clothes, and you put their clothes in the uh, washing machine, and you pour in two cups of water and turn on the machine, how clean will the clothes get? Well, that's the way with your body. Your body produces waste products in the cells. If you don't drink enough water, it can't get those waste products out of the cells, and then the cells become sick and cause you problems. So this book, Your Body's Many Cries for Water, now it has a new cover just recently that they have put on a new cover, but it's the same book. This is also written by Dr. Batman Gellage and was very, very critical in my recovery from cancer. And it is very important in every disease. The next thing is sunlight. Uh, we've got nutrition, exercise, water, and now sunlight. Sunlight is important for curing and improving every disease known to man. Once you start nourishing your body properly by eating right and drinking enough water, you will not be vulnerable to the harmful rays of the sun. Now, I'm not saying get out there and get fried and uh, get out there at the hottest time of the day. You have to use some common sense. But this is an excellent book showing how every part of your body is affected by sunlight. Then we have to get rid of the sugar, get rid of the alcohol and the tobacco and all of the things that are harmful to our bodies. That's the next law, which is called temperance. And of course, fresh air. Fresh air is absolutely essential for the body. Without it, your body cannot function properly. And rest. Rest at the proper time of night. You cannot force your body to work past its capacity and expect to be well. The only time the body can repair itself or regenerate itself is when you are sleeping. If you have a serious disease, you should be in bed by 9 o'clock. Try to go to bed soon after the sun goes down and get up when the sun comes up. However, if you are sick with a serious disease, you need to rest a great deal. In fact, those of you who have cancer or other serious diseases, when you exercise, of course, walking is the very best exercise. Do not uh, exercise to the point of fatigue. You have to conserve your energy, and you're breaking down your body if you're actually exercising too much. So we have now, we have nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, temperance, which means gets the, get the bad things out, fresh air, proper rest, and then, of course, the most important of all, the way to get rid of stress, and that is trust in God. This is the user's and owner's manual for your body. Your body was created by God. He also created the food that you eat. You see, I eat designer food. I eat the food that is designed by the same being that designed my body, and the food is given to us with all the right nutrients, with all the right enzymes in it for us to eat. And of course, it's best the way God made it, and that is raw. Well, we want to have it cooked, so we take all the nutrition out of it. But really, if we follow this book, we will find out how to get rid of anger. We will find out how to love our enemies. We will find out how to get rid of grudges and learn to forgive. You see, 
When we are stressed, when we are angry, when we are holding grudges, our bodies cannot assimilate the food even if we put good food into it because our intestines uh, don't work right and the peristalsis stops and our stomachs are contracted and our brain cannot function properly when we are all tied up with these wrong emotions. And then the last two steps are an attitude of gratitude. Be thankful for what you've got and of course benevolence. Help other people. Get outside yourself. Stop being so self-centered. Stop uh, honing in on only your problems and learn to help other people take care of them and have an interest in them. If you spend time with the Lord in Bible study and prayer every morning, and I spend an hour a day because I need it. In fact, I have found that people who do not spend time with the Lord are unable to get rid of the stress in their lives. Stress is killing us. It is one of the biggest killers. And in fact, two Christian psychiatrists have said that the number one cause of death in America is suppressed anger. We have to get rid of it. We have to let it go. We have to learn how to live with other people. We have to learn how not to be angry. All the stress that's happening around us is making us sick. We're not meant to live like this. If you follow these 10 steps of health, you can be well.